verb in the blessing in number six, and that is the verb to keep. The Lord bless you and keep you. And that verb to keep in the Hebrew can also be translated watch. And we find that verb all over the place in Psalm 121. And I thought that psalm would be such a good way for us to open the service. It's a psalm that we turn to in difficult times. We think today of the 21st anniversary of the terrorist attacks. We are also mindful of the loss of our queen. And so, and there's other things too, right? So many losses in our lives. A friend of mine's 33-year-old son died in a hiking accident this past week. We face so many things where we need to look to the Lord for our help and know that he is looking upon and watching us. So Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and your going, both now and forevermore. God watches over our worship today, and God greets you this morning. Grace and mercy, and peace to you. From God who is, and who was, and who is to come, and from the sevenfold spirit which is before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth, and all God's people said, Amen. Let's sing together 10,000 reasons. And don't. 
worship your holy name. to turn with me in our prayer of confession this morning. Just getting the words of assurance all ready to go because we know that when we come to the Lord in confession, we are already assured of forgiveness even before we open our mouths. So the assurance is ready. Let's come to the Lord in prayer. Dear God, there are 10,000 reasons to praise you. And some moments we are so mindful of that. At other moments, and maybe even in the same moment, we are mindful of the 10,000 ways that we have slipped, given in to temptation, remained quiet when we should have spoken up for justice or spoken when it was time to be quiet, given in to fear when you were calling us toward courage or acted swiftly and thoughtlessly in the name of courage. Oh God, we thank you that these 10,000 moments of failing are 10,000 opportunities to return to you and to experience your forgiveness afresh and to praise you once again. Because you are the God who keeps covenant. You are the God who keeps your promises. And you are the God who keeps us always and ever in the palm of your loving and gracious and faithful hand. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our words of assurance are from Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 to 9. The Lord is, or Moses is talking to the Israelites about the Lord's choosing them and setting his affection on them. Says the Lord did not set his affection on you and choose you because you were more numerous than all the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know, therefore, that the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God, keeping his covenant of love to a thousand generations of those who love him and keep his commandments. Thanks be to God. Let's sing a song of assurance. He will hold me fast.
bought by him at such a cost, he will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. He will hold me fast. For my Savior loves me so. offering the children's message so kids can come on forward. Kids all the way up through grade five are welcome to come forward and also welcome to go to Sunday school afterwards. So you can come on up to this front row right here. And if you have some money for our sponsored child, Giuliani, you can bring it. If you don't have any, that's fine too, but Carol's got the, the tin. Last week, Pastor Heidi talked about a passage of scripture that gave me the idea for this week's children's message. And um, I'd like to start by reading that to you. She'll probably be talking about it over the next few weeks. Let's see if I can do this with one hand. Yep. Um, I'm reading from the message version of the Bible, and it's from the book of Ecclesiastes. And I'm just going to read a, parts of a couple of verses to you. It's better to have a partner than go it alone. Share the work, share the wealth, and if one falls down, the other helps. But if there's no one to help, tough. By yourself, you're unprotected. With a friend, you can face the worst. Can you round up a third? A three-stranded rope isn't easily snapped. So this gave me the idea for an experiment that I'm going to try today. If I can get my weight out, hang on. I have a five pound weight here with one strand attached to it. I thought I'd start with one because the scripture passage talks about one person going it alone. I'm going to stand up here. Now, do you think if I pull on this um, piece of yarn, I'm not using rope, I'm using yarn, do you think I'll be able to lift the weight up in the air? What do you think? No? Well, let's see what happens. I couldn't even lift the weight with my yarn. Thank you. 
Heidi is my uh, assistant this morning and spotter and just helping me out here. <laughs> in case I hurt myself in this experiment again. So then I had the idea, well, what about, so, oh, I better say, one strand is you working by yourself, or me working by myself, or anybody here working by ourselves. Maybe on a project for school when you don't understand it and you don't ask for help. Or I was thinking about putting toothpaste on a toothbrush and you don't ask for help and the toothpaste goes everywhere. That's what it's like with one strand. It doesn't always work out well. So then I thought of using two strands. So I've got two strands this time. I got the purple. I got the purple that's the one person, but I've added a pink one to it. And I've kind of weaved them together to make a stronger rope. So I'm going to tie it around here and we'll see what happens this time. So what do you think is going to happen this time? I got my hands again. So that worked for a bit. So two people are definitely better than just one. As the scripture passage says that I read, you can face the worst. So two people working together, like maybe asking a teacher to help you with your project, or a parent to put that toothpaste on your toothbrush. Or I'm even thinking right now, Heidi and I, we're working together. It works better when there's two together. But then the scripture passage goes on to say that three strands are unsnappable. So I want to try that in my experiment too. So I have three strands here. I have the purple strand and the pink strand again, but I added a gold strand to it. So I'm gonna tie it around the way, wait, and we'll see what happens. So, what do you think will happen this time? It will break? Oh, not break. Oh, I've got some of each here going. So let's see what will happen. <laughs> no, I don't think that's a good idea. There we go. So, three strands are hard to unsnap. It's really holding. And that's just three strands of some yarn I, I found that it's kind of old. And so three strands are better. So the two strands are you and a friend or a teacher uh, or your parent or somebody from the church or Heidi, in my case, helping me today. But when we add that third strand, it's even stronger. Now, who do you think the third strand might represent? Hmm? Right on. You guys are way ahead of me on this one. The third strand is Jesus. So when we have Jesus in our lives, when we have Jesus in our life, whether in our school, at home, at church, with our friends, with your teachers and parents, it's stronger. It's a bond that can't be broken. So remember that as you uh, go to school and be with your friends, that when Jesus is with you, you can face the worst together. Let us pray. 
Dear Lord, I'd like to thank you for the children here today and for the uh, Kingdom Kids Ministry. And may they know you as that golden strand that holds them together at church and at school and at home and with their friends and family. And that you are always with them and that you're always with us too. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So kids up through grade five are invited to go to Kingdom Kids. I'll just give you these little pieces. Thanks. You're welcome. Very good. Okay. So definitely that Ecclesiastes 3 text is the text that gives us our metaphor for these final five messages. The text that I'm going to read each Sunday before, um, before the message is from Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 to 27. The ironic blessing, the blessing that the Lord gave to Moses to, gave, to give to Aaron and his sons to give to the Israelites and also comes to us as well. So Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you for your presence with us today. Thank you for Carol and the children's message and the children. God, I, I love the things that come out of our kids' mouths and, and the truth even that was on the side that in some ways God and Jesus are the same and in other ways the Father and the Son are different. And oh, the mystery of the Trinity right there in our children's message that you in some ways are one and in other ways 100% are three, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That the cord of three strands of of your full communal love for us wraps us together with bounds, binds that cannot be broken. God, we pray that your word would be strength in our life today. We pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Numbers chapter 6, beginning at verse 22. The Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say to them, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. So they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We also this morning have a question and answer from the Heidelberg Catechism. From the place where the Catechism is reflecting on the Sixth Commandment not to murder. And so question and answer 107, we have it up here for you. I'll read the question and we will respond together with the answer. Is it enough then that we do not murder our neighbor in any such way? And the answer together, no. By condemning envy, hatred, and anger. God wants us to love our neighbors as ourselves, to be patient, peace-loving, gentle, merciful, and friendly toward them, to protect them from harm as much as we can, and to do good even to our enemies. Thanks for reading that Q&A with me as well. So, if you were here last week, and if you weren't, I'll catch you up just a little bit. You heard that for each of these last five messages, I'm braiding together in a cord of three strands a verb from number six, one of the verbs in the blessing, one of our core values, and a golden thread, which is a posture that I've talked about, um, a, a, a posture that is helpful for us in our relationships with one another. So last week, the verb was blessed the Lord bless you and keep you. The core value was authenticity, and the golden thread was to know yourself. And for those who weren't here last week, the golden threads are from a professor of mine in seminary who talked about these, these five postures and dispositions that we need to be pastors, but to be good disciples of Jesus. And the sentence that held all of those together was this, in the context of our knowledge of God and ourselves and others, we pass along God's blessing in a spirit of authenticity. 
And now we turn to a new braid this week. So we have the next slide, the different braid. We have a rope there this time. So the verb is keep. The Lord bless you and keep you. The value is love. And the golden thread, the posture, the disposition is to hold yourself. Okay? And the sentence that puts all of those together to kind of braid them together well is the following. In the context of God's constant keeping, we keep and hold ourselves and one another in love without collapsing ourselves or controlling or coddling the other. Okay, so that's kind of the overview of this message today. So the first word, the verb to keep that we find in number six, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Hebrew word for keep is shamar. And if you listen to that, you'll hear why it might be a very special verb in our family. Samara's name comes from the verb shamar, which means to keep or to guard or to watch. And what a beautiful connection to last week's message. If you were here last week, we talked about how when God blesses us, he sees us. Remember how Hagar named God as the one who sees her and how when we bless others, we truly see them. So to shamar can be translated to keep or to guard or to watch. And of course, we saw that in Psalm 121, the call to worship this morning, how that shows up over and over again in that psalm, that the Lord watches over Israel. He doesn't slumber. He doesn't sleep. He watches over our life. That verb also shows up really beautifully in Genesis chapter 28, when Jacob is talking to the Lord, or the Lord is speaking to Jacob at Bethel, and he says, I am with you and will shamar you. Okay, translated, will watch over you, will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised you. So that word shows up like 470 times in the Old Testament, but you see how important it is theologically in that blessing and in the words to our forefather Jacob um, that, that God is a keeper, God is a watcher, God is a guardian. So last week we talked about how God blesses us to be a blessing. And so the question is, did, does God also keep us to be keepers? Not be keepers, be keepers. Does God also keep, keep us to be keepers? And when I think about that question, my mind immediately went to the story of Cain and Abel in Genesis chapter 4, right? So, oh my goodness, I, I read a commentary Brueggemann's commentary on Genesis 4, and it is so, it's so good. There's so much to the story, but just a little brief synopsis of it. Cain and Abel, the first brothers that we read of in scripture, bring their offerings to the Lord. For reasons not explained in the text at all, Abel's offering is received by the Lord. Cain's offering is not. Cain is filled with rage at this. He seeks out his brother Abel he kills him. And then the Lord asks the where question. After Adam and Eve sinned and hid from the Lord in the garden, the Lord called out, Adam, where are you? And now Cain. Cain has killed his brother Abel. And the where question happens again. The Lord asks, Cain, where is your brother Abel? And Cain says, I don't know. <laughs> Am I my brother's keeper? And how much irony is in that answer? First of all, of course you know, Cain, you just murdered him. And in some way you did keep him. You kept him so close that you squeezed him to death. But in other ways, of course, Cain did not keep his brother Abel. He did not watch over him. He did not guard him. He did not protect him in a way that Abel's life could continue to flourish. Cain was not acting as his brother's keeper. But the invitation to us is how might we actually keep one another in ways that not only don't murder someone else, but also do all the other things in question and answer and answer 107 of the Heidelberg Catechism that show love and flourishing to our neighbors. How do we keep one another? 
how do we love one another well? And in order to answer that question, I want to bring in that golden thread of the posture of holding on to yourself. Now, why in the world would that posture be the one that we connect with love? Well, when I was studying this core value of love in the learning community that Westside was a part of for many years, this was the posture that we talked about very often, the holding yourself posture. And the reason is that when we love someone, we are constantly hovering on the edge of falling into the tendency either to collapse ourselves, to coddle the other person, or to control the other person. Our love drifts so close to this so often. So first of all, the tendency to collapse ourselves. When we love someone, especially perhaps in the beginning of our love for someone, we want them so much to like us and to be pleased with us and to think fondly of us and, and never, we don't want to have any disagreements, any fights. You know, I've talked to people who are like, oh, my husband and I never fight. And I'm like, hmm, uh, I don't know if that's actually a good thing. But you know, you, you try to always be on the same page and, and, and we think that's what love is. But what happens when we never say what is so for us because we're afraid that they'll reject us or not be pleased with us anymore is we collapse in on ourselves, okay? And we become less of a person. And in fact, the other person is then less of a person as well because we're not able to hold in tension the things that make us different. And so the invitation is to be able to hold on to yourself in the midst of your relationship to someone else so that the other person can also be all of who they are. This is the concept that I've often talked about here of self-differentiation, being able to differentiate who you are. Hold on to yourself and your relationships to other people. I've often taught it in connection with the relationship between Paul and Peter in Galatians chapter 2, and how Paul and Peter disagreed heavily on the focus of the gospel and yet, they were able to release each other to do different ministries in different contexts. So that is a place where self-differentiation, holding on to yourself in love, shows up. But we also see it, I've also taught it, not so much here, but I did a women's retreat on the story of Jesus and the woman at the well and their conversation. I think Tim has preached on that here. And that is a beautiful example of Jesus not collapsing, certainly, on himself and saying who he was and what was so, but also giving room to the, uh, to the woman at the well to tell her story and to speak and to hold on to herself. It's this beautiful back and forth of love where neither person is collapsed, but both people are vibrantly participating in the relationship and in the conversation. The second tendency that we hover on the edge of often in our relationships of love to one another is the tendency to coddle another person, okay? To like do things for them that they can and should be doing for themselves. Now, this is a hard one, right? Because we want to do things for people and care for them and, and do special things for them to make them feel loved. There's certainly no rule against doing things for people, and yet we often drift into the land of over-functioning in people's lives, relationally, behaviorally, emotionally, and doing things for them that they can do for themselves and should be doing for themselves. Of course, when our child needs help getting toothpaste on the toothbrush, we help them, right? And I have a good friend, Bill, whose wife just had a very difficult fall, and suddenly he's doing all the things for her. Yes, of course. But we tend to carry that into all of our relationships, especially those of us who are helpers, who just like to help people all the time. We can overhelp in a way that, that kind of um, it gets rid of the boundaries that should be around us, and it also doesn't honor the dignity and responsibility of the other person to be who they are. When I think about Jesus and this, this concept of 
holding yourself so that you don't give in a way that cancels out the other person's responsibility. I think about blind Bartimaeus. You preached on Bartimaeus, Carol, right? And I preached on him too. We both, you've gotten that sermon a couple times from us. So blind Bartimaeus is calling out to Jesus. He's blind. He can't see. There's clearly something Jesus can do for him. And there's clearly something that Jesus does do for him. Jesus does heal Bartimaeus. But before he does that, he says to Bartimaeus, what do you want me to do for you? He asks him the question, right? Which shows that Jesus isn't going to just swoop in there, but wants to hear from us what it is that we need. And that honors the distinction between people. That honors our responsibility in our relationship to Jesus. And I think it's a beautiful example of that in uh, the story in Mark 10 of blind Bartimaeus. The third tendency that we can have sometimes in our, our loving relationships is the tendency to control. All right? So we love someone so much, but sometimes that love can slip. We lose hold of ourselves. We lose self-control. We see that other person as an object, either an object of contempt to be destroyed, like Cain did to Abel, or perhaps an object of desire that we consume. And we think it's love, but it's not. It's not holding on to ourselves and our relationship to someone else. It's spilling over with a lack of self-control and trying to control the other person and their movements in ways that either destroy them or consume them. And when I think about Jesus and how Jesus held on to himself and didn't try to control people, I think about another story from Mark chapter 10. This is the story of the rich young ruler that came to Jesus and said, well, what must I do to be saved? And Jesus said, sell all that you have and give to the poor and come follow me. And the rich young ruler walked away from him and was sad. And Jesus did not run after him. Sometimes our tendency when people don't do the thing that we want them to do is to run after them and try to catch them and make them do the thing, right? But Jesus didn't do that. Instead, what did he do? Right in the middle of that story, it says that Jesus looked at the man, shamard the man, watched the man, and loved him. Jesus looked at him and loved him. He did not try to control him. He did not chase after him, but he looked at him and loved him. And that is another way that Jesus shows us what love looks like and how we hold on onto ourselves in relationship to other people and how he kept and watched other people. When I was thinking about all of these three different ways that we fail to keep or to love or to watch and how Jesus invites us to a different kind of relationship with one another. I thought about something I've been learning about a lot and even taught a little bit this week in a, in a, um, a conversation with a different church, in, an Anglican church in Lakefield where I'm doing some restorative work. I taught them about the four leadership styles, which are also relationship styles. So I'm going to ask Jeff to put these up here. We have four, three filled in. We'll just hold the slide right here for a minute. These are these are four different leadership styles and also relationship styles, okay? So in the not square, you have leaders who are not functioning, okay? Or in our relationships, there's just neglect, not functioning. I would place the tendency to collapse on ourselves into this quadrant, the tendency to not be able to hold on to ourselves in any way that has definition, um, that adds to the life together, whether that be leaders and followers, whether that be people in relationship with one another of any kind. But there's also the four quadrant, okay? This is the area of leadership or relationship where the leader or the person in the relationship does everything for you, right? This is the, the coddling kind of love. This is the, the love that, that's permissive and just takes care of all the time. And then what happens when you have a leader who's over-functioning and doing all the things, 
sometimes, maybe, um, is then there's people don't underfunction. People are like, okay, she's got it. He's got it. Great. I don't have to do anything, right? So that is another leadership style, relationship style way of loving. That's not the best way, okay? Then we have the two quadrants, the two square. And this is the controlling square. This is the kind of leadership or relationship where someone's always doing things at people or to people and trying to control them, not holding on to themselves, but losing self-control and controlling others. The quadrant that we are invited to in our relationships to one another, whether they be leadership or friendships, is the with quadrant, where we are with each other in relationship, respecting the other, receiving their respect for us. We're going to sing a song after the message. We will work with each other. We will work side by side. We will guard each one's dignity and save each one's pride, for they know, they'll know we are Christians by our love. This is what love can look like when we are with each other. Not to each other, not always doing things for each other, not being in the not quadrant where we're just neglectful and passive and not doing anything, but when we are with one another. And we have a God who defines himself exactly this way, as a God who is Emmanuel, God with us. God with us. Now, are there ways in which God does things to us or for us? Sure. Of course, we find this in scripture, and we find that there are things that we cannot do for ourselves that God must do, and there are ways in which God does things to us. And there may even be times where we feel like God is in the not quadrant. Jesus thought his father was that for a moment. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But the place where we find God's promises again and again and again is when God promises to be with us in ways that don't collapse him or us, in ways that are not controlling or forceful, and in ways that are not coddling, but ways that respect who we are as his creation. As we finish, as I finish this message today, I just want to focus in on a story from scripture. Oh, where did I put it? Did anyone see my, right there. Thank you. You knew I was going to, this is the second time I've forgotten this today. Um, the story of the prodigal son, okay? Another big story that I preached a whole series of messages on before, but just focusing on briefly here. So a father has two sons. One of his son is the older son, the good doobie who stays at home and does all the things and is very responsible. And then there's the younger son. The younger son who says, Dad, I want all my inheritance right now. I'm out of here. And he goes. Notice how the father does not demand that he stay, but gives him his inheritance. He goes, he squanders it. No more food, no more money. He's hungry. And he comes back. He decides to come back and say, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. Let me be a servant in your household, right? I mentioned that the father didn't go chasing him when he left, but what did the father do? There was the father, right there, looking for his son. Shamar, watching for his son. Day after day after day. And when he saw his son, he went and he ran to meet him. Henry Nouwen wrote a book about this story in scripture. And he focused, and you see it on the front here, and I also have it there. Maybe if we could grab those lights off so you could better see the image. I know they're always hard to find, those lights. Could, could we get those lights right here off so we can see that image a little bit better? So that's the Rembrandt's painting of the prodigal son being embraced by his father. And you see the father's hands just resting on his son's shoulders. And I'm just going to read a couple of lines from Nowen's book on this. Oh, how much would the father have liked to talk to his sons 
to warn them against the many dangers they were facing and to convince them that at home can be found everything that they search for elsewhere. How much would he have liked to pull them back with his fatherly authority and hold them close to himself so that they would not get hurt? But his love is too great to do any of that. It cannot force, constrain, push, or pull. It offers the freedom to reject that love or to love in return. And then now in writes, here is the God I want to believe in. A father who from the beginning of creation has stretched out his arms in merciful blessing, never forcing himself on anyone, but always waiting, never letting his arms drop down in despair, but always hoping that his children will return so that he can speak words of love to them and let his tired arms rest on their shoulders. His only desire is to bless. This is the invitation. This is who God is. A God who invites, who watches over, who desires to bless, who keeps us. And I think we see this beautifully at the end of Psalm 121. Psalm 121 is tough. It's actually a really tough psalm to preach at funerals and in the wakes of tragedy because it says that he will not let your foot slip. But when my friend Stan's son Justin slipped in his hiking at the age of 33 and died this week, his foot slipped. And the twin towers slipped and fell into the ground and to rubble. So I, I'll preach that sermon at a funeral if you want me to, but we're going to wrestle, if that happens, with the difficulty of Psalm 121. What does that mean that God kept Justin? But here's the verse that's easier to preach in Psalm 121. He will watch over your coming and your going, both now and and forevermore. He watches over. Just like the father watched over the going of his son and his heart broke, the father watched over the coming back of his son. There's a lot of comings and goings in our life right now. Think about people bringing their kids to university. <laughs> That's hard. The going that's happening in a few weeks for me and some others, that's hard. But we can know that the Lord watches over with love our goings and our comings, our comings and our goings, until that day when he will receive us into his arms in that final homecoming and we will be with the Lord forever. Let's pray together. Dear God, we thank you that you are a God who blesses and keeps us, and that your keeping takes so many different shapes and forms, that your watching over us is not a passive watching, but a watching that is filled with love and action toward us and action with us, that you have invited us to be children in your home and co-laborers in your kingdom, that together with one another and with you, we work with each other. We work side by side. And sometimes that working side by side is very close, and sometimes we work side by side from a greater distance. And so, Lord, we pray that you would bless us as pastor and congregation as we prepare to work side by side from a little bit of a greater distance, but all within the same kingdom and the same church, all serving one God, for there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all. God, may we be known as West Side, as disciples of Jesus, by our love, by our love that respects 
the other and delights in the other and always seeks with arms outstretched to bless. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing that song that I've referred to now. Um, They'll know we are Christians by your love. I'm actually going to invite you to turn, if you would, um, in the hymnals. We'll just skip the slides all together for this one. Um, In the hymnals to 256. 256. Because that has all the four verses. They'll know we are Christians by our love. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, thank you for the privilege it is that we can come together and worship you here today. We praise you for the beautiful changing of the seasons, and we are so blessed to enjoy the bounty that you provide for us. Thank you for the start of a new school season. We pray for our teachers and students that they will have a good year of learning and glorifying you in the process as they make new friendships and discover new things. Thank you that you are with us always. Thank you also for a new season of programs at Westside. We ask that you will provide the volunteers needed to run these ministries. We think especially of Circle of Friends, Kingdom Kids, and the Junior Youth Group. And it was so nice to see the slew of kids this morning. We praise you for a beautiful weekend for the families from Westside who are attending the family camping weekend at Charleston Lake. We pray for good fellowship and bonding that is still happening there today. And now, Lord, we bring before you the prayers and concerns for your people here at Westside. For Donna to have relief from the pain that she is experiencing and for the uncertainty she is facing as she is in the process of selling her house and hoping to move to a retirement apartment. For Arnold 
as he has upcoming surgery on the 27th for his bladder cancer. May it be successful and may he be totally cancer free. We pray for Margie's son, Brian, as he is recovering from ear surgery last week. And we give thanks for Agnes's sister, Kathy, who came through her surgery yesterday. We pray for a good, clear recovery plan for her. We also pray for Agnes's other sister, Clara, whose health is declining in many ways. Give her your peace and comfort, Great Shepherd. We pray for Erica's teammate, Bella, that she will have complete restoration and healing from her brain's brain surgery. And for Loretta's friend, Sarah, who had emergency bypass surgery in Toronto last week, please grant her strength and good health in order that she can return home. We lift up to you, Jake and Dee Dee's niece, Lisa, who is having a terrible battle with cancer. Lord, in your mercy, give her comfort and peace. We pray for those in our congregation who are now, who we are connected to and that are in our hearts and minds, who are dealing with various health issues such as recovering from heart surgeries or other surgeries, coping with diseases such as diabetes, mental health issues, ALS, different forms of cancer, and for the rise in the COVID numbers in our community. You know each of these concerns and we lift them up to you now in a time of silence. We pray for Pastor Heidi as she is going through a season of discernment. We thank you for the blessing that she has been to us over the past 10 years and all that she has taught us. We cherish the time that we've had with her. Thank you that she is at peace with her decision and that she knows you are with her and you will guide her and her family through this time. We ask that you will make your path known to her as she wants to follow your will in everything she does. Bless Tim and Samara, Naomi and Zoe, as they too are going through a season of change. May your face shine brightly on them with your love. And we pray for Westside for the council as they will be entering a season of discernment too. Please make your ways known to us. We pray for a good communication relationship between the congregational members and council, that we may speak freely with each other in love. May we use the tools and resources that Pastor Heidi has brought to us to work together in whatever is next for our church. Be with us as individuals, as well as community, a community of brothers and sisters who love you, Lord. Help us to see each other as image bearers of you and know that your spirit is in each one of us. Even though we may disagree on things, we can still pass the communion plate with peace and love in our hearts. We pray for those who are in a season of grieving, for Tim in the recent loss of his grandmother, for the family of Connie Garland, a former Westsider who recently passed away, and for others in our church who are grieving losses, many who will never stop grieving. We lift them up to you. We remember today the terrorist attacks from 9-11 21 years ago and the close to 3,000 deaths. We pray for all those families remembering their loved ones today who were affected by this tragedy. We grieve with the people in Saskatchewan in the wake of the senseless stabbing of 10 people. We cannot fathom why, and we ask for your inexplicable peace that passes all understanding to prevail. Hear our prayer, O Lord. And we pray for Britain as they and everyone around the world grieves the loss of Queen Elizabeth II. Bless her son Charles in his role as king. Grant him what he needs to reign the monarchy and his, col and his colonies in accordance with your perfect plan. Globally, we pray for countries who are suffering greatly from floods, famine, war, and other disasters or tragedy tragedies. We especially lift up Pakistan and the Ukraine. Lord, have mercy. Bless our sponsor child, Juliani in the Dominican Republic, and also the missionary families that we sponsor, the Matos family in the Dominican Republic and the Barnhorn family in Nigeria. Lord, as we leave here today, we ask for a blessing of your peace and love to enter our hearts. We pray for a closer walk with you and a desire to know you better each and every day. Help us to be a beacon of your light to everyone we meet so that they will know your love also. 
And all God's people said, Amen. Uh, good morning. The offerings for this morning are for Westside Fellowship Ministries, and if you choose to so designate it for our featured offering this week for Calvin Theological Seminary. Since 1876, Calvin Theological Seminary has faithfully prepared leaders who nurture disciples and serve the church. CTS is an accredited CRC seminary in Grand Rapids, Michigan, preparing leaders to serve the church. The teaching found at Calvin grows out of an understanding of God's word as articulated in the Reformed Confessions. Graduates of Calvin Seminary can expect to be ready for effective ministry in a rapidly changing multicultural world. So please, in any event, keep them in your prayers. So Doris and Hillary will be collecting the offering because we need John on drums for the next song. So we're going to sing Oceans Where Feet May Fail while we collect the offerings today. You call me out upon the waters, the gray and unknown, where feet may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep, my faith will stand. upon the wall. 
for God's blessing. Just a little heads up. Um, I sent an email just a couple of days ago because I, as I prepared to leave, was thinking, oh, I need to make sure to visit this person and this person and this person. And all of a sudden I'm like, "Uh -uh." (laughs) uh-uh. Like, I cannot, I don't have time to like go and see and drive all over the place and see all the people I'd love to see. So I invited you, if it worked for you, to click on a doodle link and tell me all the times you'd be available. I set aside five hours on the next three Saturdays. Now, If you didn't get that email or Doodle doesn't work for you, I did put a sign-up sheet on the table right outside. Okay, all the spots that are open and there are like 30 spots, 24 left or something like that, fill it in. If we run out of spots or if Saturdays don't work for you and you would like to spend 30 minutes just blessing each other, having a hug, having a conversation, let me know. We'll schedule a different time. We're not leaving Kingston. And so I think there's this feeling of like, oh, well, we'll see each other and we're all friends and we'll still spend time together. There is an important ministry of being able to say goodbye and to say goodbye well. We are ending a chapter of our lives together. So if doing that on Sundays or at the farewell is enough for you, awesome. That's great. I won't be offended if you don't sign up for a time, but I wanted that opportunity to be there for you as individuals or couples, as families, to come to church for a few minutes in my office and you can sign up on the table out there, or you can do it on the doodle that you received, okay? So I just wanted to make you aware of that. So I'm going to extend the number six blessing over you again this morning. We read it, but now hear God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you. And from the tops of your heads to the soles of your feet to give you his peace. And all God's people said, amen. We're going to sing, let's see, uh, is this mine? Had you brought yours over? There's one there. Okay, excellent. We're going to sing that, those words in the version of Baroka by Michael Carr together. The Lord bless you and keep you. Sisters to love and serve the Lord. Mm-hmm.